Um, so, um, basically the first is a 45 year old female and she's a runner and I'm talking like a real runner. Uh, she told me that, uh, you think that I'm a lawyer who's a runner. I'm a runner who happens to be a lawyer. Um, but she felt like her pronation was getting worse. She had tried orthotics and she was getting both medial bunion pain as you would expect, but also she felt like she was getting medial uh, foot and ankle pain. And you can see she's got a little, a little gap at her uh, intercuneiform joint. Uh, that's not really where she hurt. I think she was getting some posterior tib tendonitis when she ran. Um, so Jeremy, is this the one that you're talking about? You can see you've got some pronation and clearly the sesamoids are rotated around. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, if you look at this, you know, and, and whatever guide you use, whether it's IM angles or hallux valgus angles or whatever your bunion algorithm is, I think we would all agree that this isn't a huge, ridiculous bunion, uh, but there's some features that raise concern for rotational deformity here. You see the sesamoids, um, you can kind of guess at what the posture of the toe looks like based on the, the profile on x-ray. And then you see at the TMT joint, that there's that little bit of, of gapping or a little concern for instability there. Um, and I think adding all that together, the best choice for her um, would be a, a TMT, you know, lapidus or, or lapifuse type, type procedure. Um, and, and, you know, you mentioned she's a runner who, who does some legal work on the side. Um, I have not shied away from uh, the lapidus procedure in runners. Um, and and it felt like it's been a good choice for them. Um, so our thought, the pronation is obviously what we're going after the lap, the, the medial pain. You can see it with pronation. And then the final, can you do lapis on a runner? So this is a, this is a gal. I, I really elevated her um, her post op management, and um, and she was back running in four months. Uh, she said, I ran in four months, but I was pain-free in six months. So that's, that's a real runner. Um, and, um, and, and this is her at her six-month visit. Um, so solve the problem. Sesamoid's great. Minimal bunionectomy and, um, and, uh, and a good progress. So um, just a comment on activity. Um, it's okay for runners. Um, after they fuse, it doesn't matter what kind of plate or screw that you use. All right. You know, the only thing I would add, um, Hodge, is obviously, you know, the topic for tonight is looking at, at lapidus and, and how, you know, we've kind of evolved in practice and thought process. But, you know, Chevron is not a bad procedure. And I think that, um, you know, I, I think it's fair to still have that in your algorithm, as I, I pointed out at the end of the talk. I mean, we're not looking at Chevron cases, but... I think the big thing is the clinical exam and looking at the posture of the toe. If there's an IM angle of 13 degrees and the toe looks pretty straight and doesn't look like it's significantly rotated, then I have no problem with the Chevron plus or minus Aiken to correct that bunion. I still think that's a good operation, um, but I look at the pronation of the toe way more now than I used to. Um, so I, I don't want to suggest that we've gotten away from any distal osteotomies, um, but I just, I, I characterize the bunion a little bit differently um, with, with a new lens looking at that pronation. I agree, totally. And, and this is a seven-year-old. Thank goodness it's not one of my patients. Uh, but this is, I still see a lot of this where people will put a plate on or, or use a system and don't really understand what you're trying to do with the correction. And while this, this doc got a fusion, I'm not real sure that this patient was ever corrected. And I think your, your description of your progression in this patient um, is, is important, right? If you don't understand all three planes of correction, ultimately you're gonna have some bad results. Uh, so, so now what I do here, Jerry? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, try to assess if that first TMT joint is fused only from a technical perspective, if it's healed, um, I think the proximal correction is going to be your best answer. So you would need to create more of an osteotomy um, than, you know, than a revision of a non-union. Uh, but I think addressing the joint proximally uh, is going to be the answer. And um, I have had a couple situations with recurrences where 
Um, I've had to create an osteotomy at a fused TMT joint and affect rotational correction as much as anything else. Um, and so the nice part about working through a malunion is if you make uh, a straight osteotomy across the joint, you now have a plane through which you can rotate. Um, but that would be my approach proximally. Um, sometimes after you've debrided in a revision situation, you end up with a fair amount of gap. So I have had situations where I've had to put um, an allograft uh, wedge in um, or an allograft disc in uh, to try to maintain length. Um, and that's exactly what I did here. I used a, um, I used a, a, a wedge of uh, biofoam and was able to get the correction. And she had significant arthritis in the, in the joint. So I fused it. I, I don't love doing TMT and, and Halix MP fusions. Uh, but sometimes you don't really have much choice. Um, all right, here's here's this one. Had a distal osteotomy, um, and had so had bone surgery. A young adult, um, and doesn't look like the shift was great. Um, can you use a TMT correction uh, to address revisions? Yeah, and, and I think it's. For me, one of the indications, um, I would have a hard time trying to, to do a distal osteotomy again in this patient. Um, if they have a T, uh, an MTP joint that has normal motion and doesn't show suggestion of pain or arthritis, um, then I think the TMT um, lapidus type procedure is going to be a more reliable correction, um, a bit more powerful. Um, you know, in revision bunions, for me, it's typically either a lapidus or an MTP arthrodesis. Um, you know, that MTP arthrodesis is the, is the bunion procedure that will never recur, um, but it's not for everybody. And in a, in a patient who's got a normal MTP joint, um, I, I think the, the lapidus is the more reliable way to go in a, in a revision. All right, so this, is, this was a, a good selection and uh, was able to derotate it and uh, add it to Nakin as I do often in revision surgery. All right, 62-year-old female, bunion pain, severe pronation, uh, you know, almost got a lateral on your AP, and uh, the associated cock-up second hammer toe. Are you more concerned with people that have metatarsal, lesser metatarsal symptoms, making sure that you don't shorten this, this first ray? Yeah, I, I think two things that I think about. One is shortening of the first ray. The other is is really assessing um, the plantar flexion of the first ray. And so uh, in correcting the deformity, um, really want to make sure that I'm not elevating the first ray and furthering that, um, that pressure on the second. Um, and in this situation with deformity there, um, you know, would also consider a shortening osteotomy or while osteotomy of that second metatarsal. Uh, and, and that may also help unload the forefoot a bit. Um, but, but I do think about that um, you know, shortening and the, the position of the fusion very carefully. So, um, so one of the questions that I've been asked before is what's your sequence? Do you, do you do the, the, the while osteotomy or the shortening osteotomy before you slip the clamp over it and do the lapidus or you do the lapidus first and do the corrective osteotomy afterwards? Yeah, I, I do the lapidus first. Um, and, and get that fixed and, and done, um, and, and then do the lesser toe work. Uh, we might differ in that, Hodge. I can't remember where you're at with that, but um, that's how I've done it. I've done first ray and then work over. Yeah, I, I make the decision based on how much the second toe is in my way. The second toe is in the way. I don't mind doing the all the lesser toe stuff first, uh, but then you have to really make sure that your clamp goes proximal to that osteotomy. And so this is what we're able to do. Nicely rotated, fix the hammer toe, and then did a, did a second while um, with excellent results. 49-year-old um, with regular, uh, with bilateral painful flat foot um, and hallux valgus, right greater than left. Her posterior tip was fine. She just kind of hurt all over. Has a little sag in her navicular cuneiform joint. Uh, but definitely has um, has a a little shift uh, at her TMT joint, and so I'll I'll let you you know my options are 
or to do both, uh, how would you address uh, both the flat foot as well as the, um, as the bunion here? Yeah, and I think this is, you know, maybe in the category of that patient uh, that one of the listeners asked a question about earlier. Um, you know, this is a patient who probably has two problems that are, that are playing off of one another. She's got some medial column instability, um, hallux valgus, and then also appears to have um, hind foot deformity based on your description in the, uh, in the stem, the lead in, and then looking at the x-ray. So this is one where I would try to figure out where most of her pain was coming from. If it really truly seemed to be like bunion pain, um, then I would address the lapidus and in her compare to the opposite foot, and I would consider a medial slide of the calcaneus if it really looked like there was um, asymmetry or that the that the hind foot deformity was contributing to her overall foot. Because if the hind foot still slides out and she still has hind foot valgus, even if you do a great job of correcting the bunion, she's still going to have a tendency to pronate over on the on the medial side of that foot. Um, and have a, a propensity to have increased or, or continued pain there. Yeah, and that, that was definitely my, my issue. So this is four or five years ago. So I did a second while and she had, uh, she had a, a hammer toe. And then, and then I used the, the 3DI system and I added an arthresis screw, uh, which most of us know can correct that peritoneal subluxation. And she did great. Um, so then she comes back in and she says, I want the same thing um, on my right side. This is, these are four years apart. And her bunion's not as bad, um, but her symptoms are almost identical. So I said, well, yeah, let's do the same thing. Uh, the problem was her insurance company um, said no to arthresis. So, with her, I did what you suggested, which is an MIS MDCO with a Lapifuse, and um, and she has done equally well. But she did say that uh, that um, she um, she swelled a little bit more in her hind foot after this versus the arthresis. Okay, this is a 53-year-old uh, with a distant failed bunion procedure and persistent second metatarsal pain uh, with, uh, with really no hammer toe, just metatarsalgia. Uh, so how do you address this? Can you just stabilize the medial column with no deformity, um, or do you have to do something to shorten the metatarsals? Yeah, I mean, I, I would think about if this patient's got global metatarsalgia, um, you know, this is a situation, just looking at her foot, I would think about gastroc in this picture. Um, I don't think it always comes up with all bunions, but as you describe this patient, um, I would think about that just as I look at that lateral x-ray. Um, but I don't think you have to shorten uh, a second toe um, all the time. Um, I think if you can uh, demonstrate that the first ray is, is dorsiflexed or unstable at the first TMT, that sometimes a plantar flexion um, lapidus can help offload that a bit. I will tell you, however, that my my typical would be to err on the side of addressing it. Um, I don't think you have to, but I typically would if that was one of her main indications for surgery. And I will tell you that your comment about the gastroc is is certainly salient. And uh, and more and more in my revision cases, I am adding a gastroc um, just because I I really do think that that almost all of these have a gastroc contracture. So this is the lady that I did a lapidus with a distal. Um, and, you know, I'm doing so many fewer of these because I think I'm much more, um, I'm much better at derotating. But back in the day, I would, I would shift, I would do that for the big IM angles and then I would do a distal shift. And this one, I did do a second metatarsal. But, but so this is what it looked like and I'm feeling pretty good about this. Um, but at four months, I had a recurrent. This is what she had at six months and on the right. And at four months, I had a recurrence. What, what is happening um, in this patient? And how could I have done a better job to prevent this kind of recurrence? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, you, you put the intercaneiform screw across. Um, you know, in this situation, I would wonder if it was more of a rotational concern through the metatarsal where 
the sesamoids really kind of still wanted to be lateral a bit. Um, you were able to hold them underneath the metatarsal long enough for the medial capsule to stretch out a little bit, and then they kind of fell back into their home. That would be my best guess here, um, because if the TMT joint is fused, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking carefully at the intercuneiform joint. I, I may be a little widening there, um, you know, the first view compared to the second. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you, Jeremy. I, I really think that the more that I do, the more I appreciate the ability, once I've prepared the joint, to, to get a triplane correction uh, with the system. And I am much better at derotating, and my recurrence rate has gone down dramatically since that. So, so I agree 100% that this is a rotational issue that is probably um, a user error. Um, what about the one to two screw? Um, I know you don't do it very often. There were, there were a few guys in the, on the design team that do it every time. And so the tab, they used the tab um, plate every time because they, they put the screw through the tab plate. Um, I would say that I'm more like you, Jeremy, that I use the, the one to two screw maybe 20% of the time. And, uh, and I wait to see once I have everything stable, if there's any instability, then that's when I add the one to two screw. Yeah, um, and, and that's how I've been. Um, you know, I, I know that, uh, as you mentioned, there are some folks who really believe in that screw. And, and I think it just adds another point of fixation to the, to the construct there. Um, you know, either, either the oblique screw or the one two screw, both, you know, shown to be uh, improving the, the stability of the intercuneiform space there. Okay, so mm -hmm. those, those are questions. Matt, I know you're coming up. We probably should, uh, we're coming up at the end. Um, I'm gonna say my thank yous and then, uh, and then let you close, Matt. Um, Jeremy, thank you so much. Um, I always learn stuff from you and thank you for that tonight. Um, I, am, I am very excited. I mean, you and I have been using the system for about uh, 10 months and I know um, that it's changed our ability to get this done in a quick, efficient way and our patients uh, seem to be doing very well. Um, I think it, 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 it's in the evolution and it solves a lot of problems that we're seeing with other systems. Uh, so thanks very much for, uh, for participating tonight. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it.